Welcome everyone to my first live stream. I'm Rick Walker. Now you're gonna find this live stream across multiple platforms today, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Rumble. There's links to each on my website, rickwalker.com. Today, I'm super excited to welcome Paul Vanderclay. Bishop Paul, I think he's technically a bishop, as I like to call him, <laughs> is a thinker, pastor, an avid YouTuber, and a little bit of a true cult king. So it's like a true myth, but a king of a true cult, of uh, this little corner. Uh, he had maybe, maybe a sect would be more appropriate. Um, he's hosted a variety of delightful conversations that stimulate thinking over the past six years, and you can find all those listed at his website and his YouTube channel, uh, Paul Vanderclay. Wel welcome, Paul. It's great to join you, Rick. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so I want to I wanted get your take on the Verveke interview that you posted this past uh, week. I think you posted two different videos. Uh, you had one that was a little bit edited with some of the audio editing, and then you had what I like to call the unedited, unrated version, which had everything. It had all the all the F-bombs, it had all the gore, it had all the violence, even had all the, the nudity that you'd expect from a Verveke interview. And it just got it just got overtly raw, Paul. It just got so raw, and I appreciated that. And so... It's and so you know I just want to I want to get your take on how that went down um, and I think there was a curious little moment in there where John alluded to the fact that he had never read Mere Christianity which yeah. which struck me a little bit a little bit off yeah well I, John and I have been speaking for I think we can go back four or five years conversations that we've had um, we met each other after some people had pointed out his videos. Uh, Buddhism and cognitive science that he was teaching at University of Toronto. And so I did a few comments on them. The sound was pretty bad in that. And at that point, he had some students that wanted to sort of up the production values, and they did. So John and I have become friends over the years. And, and we just sort of, whenever one of us gets an idea that we'd like to talk with the other one, send an email, set up a time. And, and so we did. And I, you know, I've been watching his, he was a, you know, it was a very, it was a favorite professor at University of Toronto, and he founded their cognitive science division. He's been sharing, um, he's been sharing that division at University of Toronto, but he's also, he's also been sort of an unusual academic in that he, he kind of backed into the academy in some ways. He was, he was raised in a Christian fundamentalist group somewhere in Canada and then very much had a, a crisis in that. Um, yeah, he had a, there, he, he talks about when he was, when he was young, he, he went home, I don't remember exactly how, the, he tells the story on a couple different occasions. He went home and nobody was there. And his particular group of Christianity believed in the rapture. And he, he was traumatized that the rapture had happened and he had been left behind. He also was was a little bit traumatized by you know, a very pa famous passage of scripture of the the unforgivable sin. This traumatizes a lot of people who read the Bible yes. because they think I've I, I I maybe I've done it and you know maybe I'm facing eternal perdition. And he went to his pastor looking for some help and really didn't get any. And this sort of drove him out of the church. And and since then he's been. Oh, on a on on a pretty significant spiritual journey through. He went through like many people do when they leave Christianity. They look into Eastern religions, various practices. Eventually, got into philosophy, cognitive science, and so he's been on that journey for a very long time. And lately, sort of downstream from Jordan Peterson, as myself and Jonathan Peugeot were, got involved in social media and and developed a following of his own, and. Part of what happened downstream from Jordan Peterson is this little gathering with myself and Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke, who all sort of got swept up in this Peterson updraft and and began having what I thought were very productive conversations. Because Christianity, Christianity can become very insular. Christians start talking to one another as if nobody else is out there. Christian conversations become unintelligible. You know, the, just watching the food fight over the super, the, the Jesus Super Bowl ad has been fascinating, and and so one of the things that we very much wanted was, can Christians and non Christians have productive conversations where we understand each other? And so this this conversation was was in line with all of those things. He's had a a project that lately 
he used to sort of frame it as a religion that's not a religion that everybody thought, are you st establishing a new religion? No. Um, but he, he very much saw that the demise of the traditional religions, or sometimes as he calls them, legacy religions, left a big vacuum in people's lives. And this has contributed to breakdown of the family, suicide rates, high rates of depression. He labels this the meaning crisis. And, and so he's been, he's been on his own journey and sort of bringing people along in this journey. And so Jonathan Peugeot and I have just continued to have conversations with him about the kinds of things that interest all three of us. And so this was sort of the, the latest one, talking about his Silk Road. He had just done a pretty significant conversation with Jordan Peterson. And... I, I also was surprised that he had never read Mere Christianity because this time when I spoke with him, one of, one of my takeaways from it was he, he talked about this, his Silk Road project because he's trying to help the East and the West understand each other better. And then he said, he said, you know, nobody lives on the Silk Road. The Silk Road only helps them get to different places. And I thought that was in some ways analogous to what C.S. Lewis talked about in terms of mere Christianity. You can't, people sometimes sort of want to be a generic Christian, but in a, you actually need to inhabit um, one of the traditions of Christianity, a denomination, a church, because it's actually in the inhabiting of it where all of the these blessings and benefits of being a Christian are actually located. The, the fellowship, the church, the... Um, the growth in Christ, all of these things that being a Christian should afford us. But if you sort of live in the hallway and never actually participate and join, so and so, I was I was I was pleased we were able to connect on that point and then talk about. He, he always has interesting points, and so yeah. And, and that, that that other comment that you mentioned a second ago, no one lives on the Silk Road. Wasn't that one of the formative? iterations of the Silk Road was to have the Buddhist monasteries built along the Silk Road, and, and they, they kind of became Taoist in, in a way. And, and, and that, that's, what, that's another striking comment that I, that I heard from him, because I thought, I thought all the Buddhist were, monasteries lived on the, on the Silk Road. Boy, that's a really interesting observation. I'll have, to, I'll have to look into that more. You know, one of the most famous incidences along the Silk Road happened not too long ago when the Taliban dynamited those huge buddhas that are that were along the silk road and and that was and those were monasteries sort of built into the caves and hills so that's 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 a really good point i i think his point was when he sort of started talking about this religion that is not a religion people kept expecting and kind of intimating that are you going to sort of start a new religion and he's really been moving back from that and you know, initially he talked about the fact that a lot of the legacy religions, as he called them, don't seem viable for people. But I, I think what we're going to continue to see is that you, it's these religions are long established things, and I, I think we're going to continue to see what I what he has labeled as this meaning crisis drive people back into. Um, I, I think in, in the United States and the West particularly drive people back into the Christian faith because, you know, we, we often sort of get a get in over our heads and think, oh, I can handle this. And then life comes up and we realize we can't. And so then, I mean, that's that's the story of how people come back to church. As a pastor, you see it all the time. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think he, he taught a lot of Buddhism enlightenment related uh, psychology courses uh, for the maybe, maybe about a fifteen-year time time span, is that yeah? Is that he, the, way, the way you understand? Yeah, he. I think he would. If you if you watch his series Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, he taps into just like there are sort of post Christians in our culture. There are now post Buddhists, and the this wave that that continued to happen as the colonizing West became acquainted with the East. England saw a wave like this of fascination of Hinduism and Buddhism. We saw another wave of that during the counterculture. People are beginning to recognize that what sort of took shape in the West wasn't really the Buddhism that was back in the other countries. A kind of a new thing arose. And so many of those people are sort of post-Buddhist, the way some people are post-Christian. And 
and they're you know they're continuing in the quest to try to figure out the answer to the most important questions of life and so yeah he he focused on buddhism for a while but he doesn't he doesn't identify as a buddhist at this point he mostly identifies sort of as someone fascinated by neoplatonism it's going to be interesting to see to what degree can you actually inhabit that and he sees neoplatonism as you know this connector by which Part of what happened as a result of the Cold War and this Iron Curtain was we were sort of cut off from the churches that inhabited that part of the world that was sort of engulfed in communism. And with the fall of the Berlin Wall, part of what we've seen is waves of immigrants coming to the United States and other Western countries from these countries. And we've seen just around us this resurgence of interest in things like uh, orthodoxy, but there's a whole range of of Christian churches and Christian impact that went all the way to China, you know, a very long time ago. And so uh, we're sort of unpacking the fact that we didn't recognize that that was a reality. And many of these people survived communism. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's striking to me to see how many how many Christian themes there are in Buddhism and a lot of the Eastern religions, the Vedic traditions, for instance. There's a lot of that going on, uh, specifically with <clears throat> Trinitarianism in in Buddhism as well, because you've got Siddhartha, or I guess the, the, the original Buddha, named Siddhartha, calls himself Tathagata, but also whenever, but whenever it's written, it's always written as Bhagavagat. Hmm. And so he's a, he's a Trinitarian identified in, a, in, a, in a, a one unified original Buddha, and and just, I mean, it comes strictly out of the Vedic traditions. Remember, the Vedic mm. traditions where Lord Krishna says, I think we talked about a second ago uh, on, our, on our last interview, maybe a month ago, Lord Krishna identifies himself as, I am the people tree among all the trees. I'm the fig tree. And, you know, you've got, uh, what do you, you've got uh, Vishnu as the leaves. You've got Shiva, I think, the trunk. And then you've got Brahma as the, uh, as the roots. And he's a Trinitarian mm. god. And so this is what you find in the original Buddhism. But, there, but also... The way that the original Buddha got enlightenment was he was sitting underneath a fig tree, and so and so you have these very common themes that that spring up in these Eastern religions, and it makes it makes Christianity and Judaism sound a whole lot more Eastern than than we would think. Obviously, it's coming out of the Middle East, but it sounds yeah. a lot more Eastern than than Western these days. Yeah. I, I think part of what Jordan Peterson sort of uncorked is this th this look at comparative religions not so much to say well my one religion trumps yours but more to kind of say there are structures built into the world and these patterns emerge and so you're for a variety of reasons you're probably going to see resonances and similarities along with dissimilarities between these religious traditions it, it's also a, the case that Christianity has been out in the wild for a very long time. Again, we tend to think in terms of the West that you have this line through the world, but Christianity got into, was in China and in Japan and in India from a very long time ago. And part of what I think we've also seen is that code, you know, Christian Christian genetic code seeped into many different religious traditions fairly early on. And so it's it's really difficult to sort of tease out where all of these themes come from. Yeah. And you made an interesting comment, I think, on your interview with was it Food Truck Emily? Um, oh. a couple of days a couple of days ago she mentioned Watchman Nee, the great Chinese yeah. theologian. Uh, who spent the last 20 years, 20 years of his of his life in uh, in Chinese prison? I think 1952 to 1972, and just that that great way of thinking. You see it infiltrate and filter through people like Dallas Willard, yeah. sort of these Eastern mythical, um, mystic, I guess mystic like type of type of theology that that helps bring life and and, and rebirth that a lot of us we we just don't pay attention to or even get access to or you think about going and reading. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dallas, of course, sort of reinvigorated the spirit him him and um richard foster celebration of discipline a lot of these books that came through in the 70s and 80s you know sort of reinvigorated the idea of christian spiritual practice 
within Protestantism, because part of what happened with Luther is Luther, in his pushing back against medieval Catholicism, you know, saw, saw a radical break. And then Christians tend to look around and bring things from other traditions. And, and again, we've seen, we've seen this in, in how many different ways that the, even Protestants and Catholics, the charismatic Catholic movement, the rise of Pentecostalism and Protestantism, you see these shifts where there's, they're often sort of trading code and trading ideas between them. And so, yeah, it's, it's, th there has been a sort of Silk Road happening for a long time where people have been comparing notes and saying, oh, how are we to think about what we, when we compare these things to each other? Yeah, yeah. And then they see it play out like in the Roman triumvirate. I mean, you, you have all these sort of things that are, that are practical in nature as well that, that really reach, reach beyond religion. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so tell me, like, what, what are you working on right now? What, what's, your, what's your top ministry priority right now? My top ministry priority. I don't. I don't. I. I. I, I struggle with hierarchies. Um, I, on Sundays, it's it's you know working working with Living Stones. The ladies coffee. The ladies Bible study ministry is going right now, and uh, one of the women brought some. Uh, she's from Louisiana. Brought some gumbo and sweet potato pie, um, and and so for the for that minute it was you know sitting down and many of these many of the women are are getting up there in years and listening to their their stories and um and no my my week is full of a lot of different things and, you know there's obviously caring for the people in my church uh, i just got a phone call from someone that i got to call back and then continuing these conversations online and doing what i can to hopefully as a pastor the, the main goal isn't to have everyone talk to me <laughs> you know obviously as a christian minister the main goal is to have people talk to jesus and the the other you know you have to love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself so those are two things that you're always working and ideally the better they love god the more capacity they have to love their neighbor and so i'm always i'm always just working on that in small and subtle ways with people that's tends to be my ministry focus yeah yeah and so you you do a really good job of trying to synthesize these different uh, I guess themes from different domains, from culture or from from history, theology. Obviously, when was it that you realized that you had a gift for being able to understand these these sorts of concepts and try to glue them together in a way that makes it makes sense for people to to, to ingest and to absorb? I don't know that I ever figured out that I had a gift for it. It was just what I always did, and like. A typical morning like this morning, I've listened to and seen four or five things that's like, oh, I'd really love to chew on that a little bit more. I'd like to chew on that a little bit more. And, you know, I, you can think about these things, but finding people, other people who would be interested in them was kind of hard because just in normal life, people are busy with their own cares and concerns and their own things upon their table. And so I would... I used a blog for a number of years just to note these things because I'd also find that even though in any given day, five to 10 ideas sort of percolate up into my head and then I'd keep lists of them. And then as I'd sort of be working on my sermon or, or Bible studies throughout the week, those things that I worked on would get sort of processed then into the sermon because you have the text of the sermon. You usually need some kind of illustration that connects the text to uh, the world, John Stott wrote a good book on preaching a number of years ago called Between Two Worlds, because you're always trying to connect people up to the world of the Bible. But, uh, you know, the sermon can bear maybe one or maybe two illustrations that do that. And I've had 50 or 100 such thoughts during the week. What do I do with all those thoughts? So along came YouTube, and it started with Jordan Peterson, but... I was interested in way more stuff than just Jordan Peterson, so I just I kept making videos and people kept leaving comments and wanting to talk about it. So I always saw this stuff, this ruminating on what's going on in this broader spiritual conversation and cultural conversations as sermon prep, and it just kind of maybe got a little out of hand. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't even watch all your content. It's it's so much. 
And, and if I can, in, so, so this past week, I finally realized I've always watched your sermon, I think your rough draft on yeah. Sundays. I think you yeah. do it on Saturday, something like that. And I didn't even realize you posted your Sunday sermons until yesterday. I'm like, well, this, this is <laughs> basically the same thing, I guess. I don't know. I, I just don't have time to watch, watch both of them. No. And no. Uh, it, it's, it's, very, it's very impressive. But I, from what I gather when I, when I listen to other podcasts in your sphere, that, that a lot of these guys are just absorbing 100% of it, and they're trying to synthesize it among themselves. Yeah, what percentage of the audience actually can watch all of it? it? It depends a lot on what their life circumstance is. For example, tradespeople, tilers, truck drivers, they have a lot of hours in the day where, you know, some of them can listen to stuff while they do stuff just to keep, you know, sane. And so some of them absorb a fair amount of content. Others just get different aspects of my channel. And that's something that's often lost on people who watch my channel in that in let's say if a video gets two or three thousand views and then another video gets two or three thousand views, they're by no means the same people watching both of those videos. And the different kinds of content that I produce, people tend to focus on different kinds of content. And then people say, well, if I want to get started on your channel, what should I start with? And I usually say, well, the YouTube algorithm is probably going to help with that because YouTube algorithm has been looking at the other kinds of things you've seen. So it's probably going to find something that I'm doing that's connected with what you've seen. So and that seems to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's, I want to talk a little bit about your, your, your Sunday sermon this past, I guess yesterday, two days ago, something like that. Whatever, whatever, whatever day it is these days. Uh, and, and so you, you had a, you had a great rough, draft on Saturday that you released about Alexander the Great. And um, it, it, was, it was really interesting because I, my wife and I, we spent a lot of Christmas uh, at, at some meetings up in, up in Manhattan. So we were actually in Christmas, Christmas Day up, up there. And I was in the Met. And of course, if anyone knows, knows the Met in, in Manhattan, it's in Central Park, like in kind of the, the commerce capital of the world. And so you kind of think about that. You have the, the, the height of artistry, maybe outside the Louvre there, um, inside of Central Park, inside of the, the respite of the largest, most, most wealthiest city, inside the, the, the capital, which, which capital controls power from my perspective. So it's more powerful than any governmental capital. And then in this obscure room in there, there's this Rembrandt. I want to mention Rembrandt because I know, I think you're Dutch, right? You've got a, yeah. you, you have a Dutch last name, I think. And, uh, and he's got this great painting there with Aristotle um, with a bust of Homer. It's, it's I think, a 1653 painting. Hmm. And then on on Aristotle, he has a golden sash. And by the way, people don't know this. Aristotle actually, I think he outlived Alexander by a couple of years. Hmm. And of course, he, he was his tutor. But yeah. on his sash, he has a golden emblem of Alexander the Great there. <laughs> and so and so it's, it's, it's thought that this painting, of course, these paintings didn't have names back then when they when they painted them. They just we, we gave them titles just haphazardly. But it was it's, it was thought that that Aristotle was pondering what it meant to have glory and to, mm. and to be pervasive and to have a legacy yeah. in terms of, you know, did he create the greatest tutelage of Alexander or was it Homer that, that wrote the book that Aristotle gave Alexander that, that kind of gave huh. off this, this God-man uh, mythology that he used to, to conquer the country, these nations. Yeah. And so I was thinking about that when I was listening to your, your rough draft from, from Sunday um, but what, give me, give me a, like kind of your, your perspective on what Alexander and how you kind of thought of Alexander, uh, in, in terms of, I think it was a story in Mark from that was, I think they were walking around Caesarea Philippi, I think. Right. If memory serves. Right. And the disciples, um, Jesus asked his disciples, they're up by, they're up by Caesarea Philippi, which of yeah. course named after Caesar, named after Philip of Macedonia, um, Alexander the Great's father. Who do you say that I am? And and to me, you know, when I when you preach a sermon, you've you know you, you focus on the biblical the biblical text, obviously, but you have to try and connect it with people's lives. And part of the difficulty of getting your mind around Jesus is exactly what he was and what he did. Because in, in the context of the first century, 
many in that context were looking for it's it's in if you read the new testament if you sort of understand what their anxiety is they're looking for the deliverance of israel what do you, what do you mean by that well of course israel had this storied past of david and solomon when they were sort of the regional power they were you know a, a very small empire and and ever since then you know you have the divided kingdom and they're always subject to the uh, the larger empires, either Mesa, either Egypt to the west or Mesopotamia to the north and the, and the east. And so Israel always had this self, self-identified self as God's chosen people, but they lived life as the empires, you know, the, the, they, were, they were on the Silk Road between the empires back and forth they'd go. And, and so they're always looking for someone to relieve them from the empires. And of course, um, before Jesus, the Maccabees had sort of done it with the Greeks. They had, they had of course, Alexander dies, the, the empire split up between his generals, and, and the Maccabees sort of threw off the Greeks and had a period of autonomy. But the autonomy wasn't what, if you read the 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 exilic and, and post-exilic prophets were imagining at, that Israel would be delivered and Israel would rise to be the preeminent nation in the world and they would inherit the kingdom and all of this stuff. And so you had this series of would-be messiahs come through and none of them worked. And the worst thing that could happen to your aspirational messiah would be for the, you know, the empire to get a hold of him and to kill him because that's what you do with an insurrectionist. And so then, of course, Jesus is with his disciples around Caesarea Philippi, and he uses that context to ask his disciples, who do people say that I am? Now, the answers are all very much in line with the story of Israel, you know, uh, Elijah. And John the Baptist was sort of seen as an Elijah figure, but, and then Jesus turns it to them and says, who do you say that I am? Well, you're the Messiah. Okay. But what does that word mean? That's the real question. Because they say you're the Messiah. And then Jesus, who earlier in the Gospel of Mark had everything he said to the crowd, he speaks in parables. Everything to the disciples, he'll speak plainly. So he speaks plainly, says, this is what's going to happen. Everybody wants to know what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. We're going to go down to Jerusalem. I'm going to get arrested. And I'm going to be killed. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. Of course, the rise again part, they had no understanding of what that meant. The killed part, they knew all too well. And they said... This is not what Messiahs do. <laughs> this Messiahs, you know, I remember Donald Trump when he was, uh, you know, talking about John McCain. I prefer my, I prefer my heroes not tortured, you know. <laughs> I, I prefer my Messiahs not crucified. And that's the whole world. Alexander the Great was a god because he conquered the world as a young man. Within, within what happens, what Jesus does with the Jewish stories adds this tension that had always been there because you saw it with Job. And people who watch my video see sort of God number one and God number two because there's sort of the God of everything that happens. But then there's the God who acts and intervenes. And so if Alexander conquered the world, clearly he had the favor of the gods if you're a polytheist. But if you're a monotheist, he had the favor of God. He was God's son. And Sons of God don't get crucified. I mean, everybody understood that. Even in Islam, when they, you know, Jesus died on the cross. No, of course not. Why wouldn't Jesus die on the cross? Because God would never let a great prophet like Jesus die on the cross. Right there's all this tension. And after the sermon, you know, a very sharp man came up to me and says, oh, I always love your sermons, but you know, when I think about heroes, I identify as like firemen and soldiers and people who give their lives for the people. And I said, that's because Jesus changed the definition of a hero because he gave his life for the world. And so you have all of these themes that are in tension coming up against each other. And it's difficult for, for people who have been immersed in the Christian story for 2,000 years to understand, Tom Holland, of course, brings this out nicely in his book, to understand the, the tensions involved in the gospel stories. But, but those tensions are in our lives too, because every time 
a calamity happens. Um, there's a you get you get the word that you or someone you love has cancer, and Jesus, why don't you save me? Well, there suddenly there are all the tensions because you can you can if you pray with enough people and enough people come to you with prayers that have been answered in their favor, you realize, well, God does answer prayer. But then you also begin to recognize that many people who get their prayers answered, sort of like the 10 leopards, nine of them go away and say, sure, it's nice not to have leprosy anymore. <laughs> and one person turns around and is actually transformed. And so this is... This is the tension that is in Christianity, where on one hand, yes, God does work miracles. Prayers get answered and people get saved. And then there are the times when the cancer stays and the other shoe falls and there is no deliverance. And then suddenly you say, well, should I go look for a better God? And in Christianity, you say, oh, the Son of God prayed in Gethsemane to, you know, is there another way? And the answer is no, and he still goes to the cross. But again, then he is raised from the dead. And so this story, this story basically continues to, to, to haunt us and captivate us. And so then as a preacher, you're just always looking for angles to help people once again be captivated by it, but in a way that gives them the kind of the kind of spiritual muscle that has always caused the church to be strong in the strangest way, to um, th to be to be the kind of people who can be patient with one another and forgive one another and have all of these Christ-like virtues that communicate love even to the undeserving. And if in fact, by God's spirit, the people of God in the church possess these things, well, then, then, the, then Christ's, um, you know, Christ's word to the church about our endurance until he comes remains true. And so we're always living in that tension. So I don't know if I answered your question. I just gave you another little summary of the sermon. Yeah. But um, I love that. I love that. So it, it seems like he was, he's was he been doing that in the, the chapters prior to this. I think this was yes. maybe out of Mark, Mark 8, yes. something like that. I mean, you see Mark Mark 4 and 5 where he goes to the Gadarenes across the sea. He's, yep. he's, working, he's dealing with a guy that's possessed, yep. who's yep. living among the tombs. He comes, yep. he comes back diseased. Yeah. He, he's he's, un, he's impure. The secret nation woman touches him, makes him unclean. Yeah. But then he's walking through the crowd. He's touching everyone else. But he's he's not unclean. No. He, he's, no. He's really he's flipped the story just like you said. That's right. And it's and and so on one hand, people sometimes want to say, "Well, Jesus is a wonderful example," and he is. He is. He is our example. He is the icon, the image of the invisible God. He is that. But he is also not. You can't just pigeonhole him as a successful man like Alexander. Because what would that look like? And, and so in talking to some of my friends sometimes who, who they'll say, well, I would have believed Jesus if the ascension is really a problem. Because if, if we had Jesus, if we had the ascended, we have the resurrected Jesus now 2,000 years old, sitting on top of Mount Hermon with, um, with Elijah and Moses coming to visit regularly, that, then I would believe, and I, the, the answer to that is then you would believe what? Because what exactly are you hoping for? And this is the other strangeness where it's obvious that if you come down with cancer, what salvation looks like is no longer having cancer. But what did salvation look like before you had cancer? And, and what you find with human beings is they're always sort of just trying this chase in Harry Potter terms, this snitch. And, you know, and it's, this, it's this unobtainable thing. And, and I think part of, what, part of what I, you know, when I read Jesus in the Gospels, part of what I see in him coming is that 
the promise that we get from him, which is which is born out then in the book of Revelation, is what we are in need of is a new heavens and a new earth. And this is what we must inherit because the flesh and blood that we have here can't quite, we need creation 2.0, we need new flesh and new blood. And of course that then for people, well, that, that sends us off into all kinds of other avenues, but that's that that I think is is the gospel. And when people say, well, what, do I, what about details? I said, well, what, what kind of details would actually help you in that? Because the, the alarming thing is that, you know, so in a recent video, I sort of contrasted Miley Cyrus winning the Grammys with this story of a woman in a nursing home um, who is this, this woman in this nursing home whose face is half eaten by cancer. And it's a crappy nursing home, so the whole place smells of urine. And you look at her and you think, gosh, that life must be a living hell. And then you talk to her and you discover that actually she's far happier than people who are in the biggest, beautiful, best homes in the nicest neighborhood in your city. And she's happy because of Jesus. And and you might look at it and say, well, I would like to be my, Miley Cyrus receiving accolades and awards and all of that. But then we also know what was it was it jim carrey you know two-time golden globe winner what would you like to be jim carrey three-time golden globe winner they're, they're sort of a they're sort of a like the the car in front of the horse thing going on in this world and so our life is not exactly as obvious as we think it is and the christian story i think engages with all of this at a very deep way and leads us to say things like Okay, if my life takes a really bad turn, and if I wind up in that nursing home, and if my friends um, forsake me, Jesus will still be with me, and I can cling on to him. He is really all I need. And when you're preaching to, I mean, part of what's fun about the rough drafts and then the Sunday version, the sound capture is never very good on the Sunday version, so I don't often post it on my channel. Rick and I are working on that. We'll probably get it right at some point. But it's one thing listening to a video of some, you know, balding middle-aged man on YouTube. Being part of a church and a congregation, it's so much more messy. But potentially, what you what you you can't love me very well through the video you know you can you can put on a super chat or you can donate to patreon or you can send money to livingstone shirts all of that but what you actually get if you're a member of a church is that you get the opportunity to love difficult to love people and most people would say well why would i want to do that <laughs> ah it is more blessed to give than to receive. And if you begin to learn that, well, now you're on to something. And, yes. and so, and if you go to a church, that's what you'll find. People who are hard to love. <laughs> I, I used to be the guy when people would come forward to join church, I would take them in the back room to, to make sure, hey, you know, you've really got this, this, this. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the common things I, I, I would tell everyone, where'd you, where did you leave? Well, you know, this church, they just didn't understand me. There were bad people there, whatever it might be. I said, well, the only one thing I can promise you is that is that <laughs> you're coming over here, that all you can do is find a church full of hypocrites just like you. And so if you're comfortable with that, like, we might be the place for you. But if not, you know, you, you need to find somewhere else because that's all that we can offer. That's right. That, that's, 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 right. It. that's That's it. That's right. it. And, and the beautiful thing, I think, I think also you said it's more blessed to give than to receive. I think there was maybe a maybe a, a like one notch higher that jesus offers at some point in there where he says that it's it's better to give uh to someone who can never repay you yes um and, and so and so if you can find someone that has no chance of ever repaying you that seems to have maybe maybe a, an up ratchet of the of the benefit to you and it seems like you're doing that both online and then also offline with some of the people in your congregation well, I I don't know. I you know, I I have to I have to give credit to my father who was also a minister and you know, I watched him spend 36 years pastoring a little church that would never make it to Christianity today, would never grow very large, and it was in a little struggling area of Patterson, New Jersey, which is 
<laughs> I went back to New York City in 2006. I'd grown up just outside of New York City and you know went to college in, um, in 1981. And I came back in 2006 and was like, New York City is different than it was in the 1970s. You know, in the 70s, it was the Warriors and Abe Beam and going bankrupt and the blackout. New York City was a mess in the 70s. You come into 80s and it's all full of these beautiful wealthy people walking on the street and you know what happened to the gritty grimy new york and then i went back to patterson where i grew up in 2013 after my father died and thought same thing didn't happen to patterson it was probably worse than when i lived there and <laughs> and so i watched my father i've watched my father minister to the the people of Patterson, New, New Jersey, most of whom were either African Americans who came up from the South during the Second World War for the jobs, or um, or the children of that generation. And I just saw my father pour himself out for people who um, people who struggled. And he, my father, never. <laughs> if he if he had these thoughts, which he probably did at time to time, I never saw him. I never saw him say, oh, I wish I had a bigger church. I wish I had more spotlight. I wish I had more acclaim from the world. He enjoyed loving the people there, and they enjoyed being loved by him and loving him back, and loving him back with the ways that they could. You know, they didn't have any money. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't have anything that the world would look at, but they loved him back. And growing up in that, you could see the beauty of this. And just say, it, it gives you a it gives you a sense of the gospel. That yeah, okay, the God God has God has poured His riches as you know, the Book of Corinthians says in earthen jars, and and they're even cracked. But in those cracks, sometimes you see the glory shining through out of those cracks. And so, you know, my to the to whatever degree. You know, I have any attention on YouTube. I mean, people look at it and say, oh, you've got all of these subscribers. And it's a, it's a little channel, and I think it's I think it's just fine that way if the corner stays little. Um, anybody's welcome. You got a whole bunch of you got a whole bunch of people who will who are just the same kind of people you're gonna find in church, but that's okay. Yes. Yep. Yep, yep. You had a you had an interesting com comment earlier on today. I think it was uh, the Jazz Cow interview <laughs> yes, about jazz. jazz, and and so yeah, there, there's the, and you just mentioned the kind of the African American culture that it seems was was pervasive where you where you grew up, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. That the African American uh, church culture specifically, they're the ones that brought jazz to the forefront, right? You've yeah. got you've got this yeah. blues move with this simplified yeah. uh, one yeah. four five one. Uh, core progression. Uh, you've got the the idea where you're you're mournful as you progress toward the grave, but after the after the the body is lowered, it's yeah. it's a jubilee. It's a it's yeah. a it's a it's a it's a great glorious thing. And this is a this is an example of broken people who who whose very lives and, and their backgrounds are coming out of slavery and injustice. They create this new form of music that is their prayer in a way. Yeah. For justice, they want yeah. to see justice in the end. They may not see it in their own lifetimes. They want to see justice in their end. And I think it was um, uh, Louis Armstrong, the great, the great jazz trumpeter, who said, "You know, was not an educated man, but he he said that uh, you is what you blow. You is what you blow. Like like the the music that you sing is what's really inside of you. That's that's why I know what kind of man you are." And yeah. you you see that kind of the rich theology, the rich yeah. psychology of, of of that sort of Thing without any education whatsoever, it just it just one of those most beautiful things that came out of Americana and and this 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 horrific background, but it comes through the church into society to change it. Yeah, I, I saw I can't I, I can't remember his name right now. He played uh, Mr. Fox in the Batman movies. Famous African American actor played God in the. I, I remember him, an interview in which he said. He couldn't stand February as um, basically African American History Month because it sort of separates out the fact that there's absolutely no understanding American culture without the contributions of black Americans. I mean, you just saw it in the Super Bowl, Usher. You see it in rap music. You see it, you see it, and not just the, 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 
the musical contributions of African Americans, but in just about all levels, African the African American story is an American story, and it's it's one of the it's one of the most Christian American stories by virtue of the you know the, the terribly difficult stories of of you know race based slavery in the South and then Jim Crow, but it's a it's this astounding story of triumph. And it's a it's a it's a deeply American story, and so um, I've been I've been remarkably blessed to have spent most of my life ministering um, with African Americans, among African Americans, and in predominantly African American communities. But it is it is deeply deeply American because there's no there's no understanding American history without the contributions. Of, of those who were brought to this country against their will, but yet came here and, you know, have made it their own and blessed the country richly. Yes, yes, yes. So in your sermon prep on Alexander, did, did you get into any of these rabbit holes about the, the fountain of life or, or any, any of that stuff? My, my whole, I mean, if anybody watches my channel, you have to understand that my whole, my whole head is a rabbit trail. I mean, I, they're just, they just, any given morning I'm after five to ten rabbit trails that most of which I don't have nearly enough time to actually dig too far. So no, I hadn't I didn't get I didn't get too far into the Alexander um but again, you know, part of what I would have loved to have brought into the sermon, but there's nowhere near enough time in a sermon. Ideally a sermon would hit about 20, 25 minutes and so most of that those those who see my sermons, I'm a little bit different from some preachers in that most of what I do in my sermon is sort of walk through the text with people. A lot of preachers will sort of hit the text at the beginning and jump in it with like a dive board and make the points that they want to make. I, I'd rather sort of walk people through the text. But so if you look at, say, Jonathan Pajot's channel with Richard Rowland in their Universal History series, Alexander is just such a fascinating figure because the... You know, the Eastern Church in some ways sort of makes him a quasi-saint in that, you know, he, he did bring some of these riches of Greek culture to the world. And so there's a goodness in that. But, you know, he was, after all, a, you know, it, it, it was it just it, the reason I got the illustration because I was on Twitter and someone on Twitter was expressing you know, anger at Netflix for turning him gay. And of course, anybody with any historical knowledge would know th this whole question about pre-Christian sexuality is this enormous subject that you're, you know, and today, you know, maybe maybe gay Alexander will will be celebrated in June or something. Who knows? <laughs> but it's just watching this stuff go on in the culture is just fascinating. Well, I think I think his father Philip was actually assassinated by one of his former boy lovers, as well. I mean, it, it, it's so it's so pervasive there. But I did the same thing. I turned the Netflix series on, ready for like a, a an eight hour binge, and it was like two three minutes in, I I turned it off. I just like I know it's history. I just don't want to see it. I just don't want to see it. Which was so, which was one of the other takeaways of John Ver, my talk with John Verveke. He said, you know, I'm you know I'm not a homophobe, but I just don't like watching men have sex okay okay just, just, just call it what you will i just don't want to see it yes 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 i you know i got a, i got a wife in the next room i got i got daughters in the next room like i can't i can't chance it i can't chance it i don't want to see it so and also you got to assume they've got an algorithm as well like i want them to i want them to see that i stopped watching it and i delete it from my from my play my playlist after two minutes it would be it would be fascinating yeah you know that netflix knows when people turn on and when people turn off and so the, the discussions in the in the back rooms about these kinds of analytics have to just be fascinating in terms of in in terms of all of this stuff that's in our culture right now <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, like you, you never know like how many conversations people like you and I have to have where it starts like let's have a conversation about Game of Thrones. Not that I've ever seen it, but this when this happened, you remember when this happened? That's right. <laughs> it's like it's like it's like the story. It's like the story when you when you go to when you go to Las Vegas for the week for a convention or something. And you come home and you go to church on Sunday. What, what happened to you this week? I had to go to Nevada. You, you always go to Nevada. You never go to Las Vegas. <laughs> Well, 
was funny because we had a we had a church conference in Las Vegas, and I remember I went there with my deacons, and um, <laughs> it was just it was just so funny because we said to the organizers, "Why here?" And well, Dutch thriftiness, we could get plane flights and hotel rooms cheap. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Vegas is is a city in in Nevada, and you know they've you know they got hotels and restaurants and all that stuff too. You don't have to you don't have to go to all the other places. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, so so the let's, Dutch now. So so you're like Amster, Amsterdamian like Holland Dutch is kind of is is your like your name background is that is that where ties in there or what's the yes. So actually, I don't have a lot of Dutch in me. I've mostly got Frisian and Jewish. Now, now people will hear Frisian and they'll be like, well, what's that? Well, they're this little people group that was in the north of the Netherlands, kind of bled over into Germany. They're, they're a very ancient people and you can find out about them. They're mostly in the northern Netherlands there. They have their own distinct language. And then the other group were... Um, it's funny because uh, a few. My father died in 2013. A couple of years before he died, a uh, re relative of his had a friend who was a genealogist and did a genealogy on him. And then suddenly we learned how Jewish we were. And so apparently, what happened with a bunch of the Jews in the Netherlands was probably under the reign of Napoleon. Everybody needed a last name. At least that's how the story goes. And so a bunch of Jews picked a very biblical name of the clay. And then when my great grandfather came over from Ellis Island, the you know they always scrambled the names a little bit, and so we have this rather unusual last name. But it is it is Dutch, and the Christian Reformed Church in the United States was founded mostly by Dutch immigrants in the late 19th, early 20th century, and then after the Second World War. So the this this little Dutch subculture held itself together for a number of years with their a typical kind of immigrant church dynamics with their ethnic roots, and so that's where that's where the name came. And most many of the people from the Christian Reformed Church would tend to. We had Christian day schools, and so we tend to go to day schools with all these people with Dutch last names, and we have Christian colleges, and so we kind of kept to our own until after World War II, kind of spanned out and spread out and joined the rest of the melting pot in America. So, yep, Vanderkleitz, yeah. Dutch it, last name, and and of course, of course, Brussels is is. Uh, Belgium has, is, a, is a form of Dutch as well, and I guess both of them are sort of a form of German in a way. Well, the, the Dutch are more German, English, okay. the, the Belgian more French. So, okay. Okay. so, so the Netherlands, this, these low countries, they were kind of the, the bottom land that those weren't, those, those are the last places you settle. And so the Dutch sort of you know, took what they had and made a lot out of it. They're 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 a really amazing country, um, very small, but um, yeah, they've always been sort of an in between because you've got England, you've got France, you've got Germany, and a tiny little Netherlands. So, kind of yeah, like the Jews yeah. in that they're they're at the intersection, and it's not always a good place to be when empires want to do something. That's true. That's true. So when I was in college, we went to Bruges, Belgium, to plant a church. Oh, and okay. I took, a, I took I took three years of German in, in high school, and I just thought, you know, I'll walk in there. I'll, I'll I spent all week, Paul, all week going door to door, inviting people to church in German, not realizing I was offending every single household that I was going to. <laughs> and, and so, can you guess how many people showed up at church on Sunday for my list? Zero. Another German houses. invasion. This time yes. on, on, from an American. <laughs> From a cocky American, that's right. That's why he was coming in with a, as a as a messianic figure to save them all. That's right. Oh, oh yeah. Well, it's 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 Christian ministry can be a hilarious thing sometimes. It really can. You do some things and you yeah, just laugh yeah. sometimes. <laughs> well, so CRC, I think I think there's 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 various forms or, or offshoots of that. Can you kind of give us kind of the the the, the general bent of it, where it sits within the maybe the reform uh, background, and then also uh, conservative, liberal angles and the different arms of that. So the the reform church. I always get this wrong. The reform church in America is the oldest Protestant denomination 
in the New World, brought over. That was the state church in the Netherlands. So the Netherlands has this fights this rebellion against uh, King Philip to to separate themselves from the Holy Roman Empire, and they become reformed. The Anabaptists got in there, and then they basically became reformed. And following sort of the teachings of John Calvin, and the state church was was that church. Now that state church, of course, came over to New Amsterdam, that little slice in New York and New Jersey. That was New Amsterdam that eventually got absorbed by the British and conquered by the British. Um, that was the state church. In the 19th century, it's helpful to, to think about the history of Christianity over the last few hundred years as tensions with, with modernity and the Enlightenment. And in the 19th century, the state church in the Netherlands was seen as predominantly an urban church, and many of these rural communities in the Netherlands uh, didn't like the way the church was going and wanted to de separate themselves from it. So you had these church separatist movements, and there was a movement in the Netherlands called the Offskiting, which was a separation, and later with Abraham Kuyper, um, another separation. The In the 19th century then, there was, um, the Dutch started, you know, as you, you'd have famines and things go through in the Netherlands. And the poor rural Dutch then tended to leave in larger numbers, leave the Netherlands in larger numbers and come to America. And so they had the Reformed Church in America, but many of those churches had been here for a very long time already. We're already Americanized. We're already having services in English and all of that. So these new waves of immigrants they had certain particular beliefs about a variety of things of the day. They separated themselves, and that's where sort of the an accumulation of them formed what today we call the Christian Reformed Church in North America. They kept the Dutch language services and many of the Dutch traditions of these separatist churches, these conservative separatist churches in the Netherlands had them in America. And then when immigrants would come, they would they were happy to find a church and then a school that spoke their language, and so they tended to stay among their own. Sure. Yeah. Until the First World War. The First World War was an important turning point. People remember anti-Japanese sent, um, sentiment in the Second World War because of Pearl Harbor. There was tremendous anti-German sentiment in the United States during the First World War. And, of course, of course, German is Deutsch, which sounds a lot like Dutch. And you had these groups of people that were worshiping in a language that Americans didn't understand, and they sure looked German. So at this point, the Christian Reformed Church starts saying, you know, that there was actually a church in Iowa that was burned down because the neighborhood thought they were a German church. So they start putting flags all over their churches and start services in English, and we're not German, we're not German, okay? And, um, and that continued. And then into the Second World War, that's what happened with many ethnic churches. The young men who had grown up in farms, they knew some Dutch because their parents were still knew a lot of Dutch. They were mostly living in English. Then they all get drafted into the Second World War where they meet all of these other Christians from all of these other groups. And you really begin to also in some ways see the roots of what today we would see as neo-evangelicalism with, um, you know, with uh, Billy Graham and this whole movement that would arise after the Second World War. So... That Second World War really brought the Christian Reformed Church sort of into the mainstream of churches. So after the Second World War, you had people who had grown up in these Dutch colony areas in the United States now moving to bigger cities. The GI Bill, they're getting an education. So this also is a very American story. So now you get Christian Reformed churches planted in places like Sacramento. If you go down the valley an hour to Ripon, California, where everyone, all the CRCs sort of met to first try and do dairy, and then they said, oh, I can make more money growing almonds. Um, but then they're moving to Sacramento, to some of the other cities in America. And so during during the latter half of the 20th century, the Christian Reformed Church is sort of wrestling between sort of its Dutch ethnic, distinctly reform roots, and then the two main forces in American Christianity, which are the main line and the evangelical. But because the CRC was always sort of had a conservative bent they're always sort of maybe 70 to 80 percent conservative evangelical, maybe 20 percent more like the main line in terms of the way they've been looking. So that's been the tension in the Christian Reformed Church. It sort of has reached a head in 2022 when over a number of years, 
some groups wanted to have the Christian Reformed Church embrace same-sex marriage, and that thing just built up to a big fight where in 2022 the Christian Reformed Church basically said, no, we're going to stick to the traditional definition of marriage, and that's sort of been this watershed analogous to what you've seen you know, 20, 30 years before in the Presbyterian Church of the USA. So the Christian firm, but the, the tensions within the Christian firm church continue. To what degree do we sort of hold to our confessional roots in you know, our Dutch confessionalism? To what degree are we sort of part of American evangelicalism? And then of course now that the most disaffected group right now are those that sort of were becoming more and more mainline and now they're kind of like, ooh, do we have a place in the Christian Reformed Church? So that's that's in a nutshell, there's the history of the Christian Reformed Church. And so the 2022 movement was parallel to the United Methodist movement, it seemed like, with the same right. sorts of, of right. implications. Now, what about what about female clergy? Because historically, the, the, the introduction of female clergy has, has been the immediate prelude to the same-sex marriage and that and that sort of strain that causes the, the, the actual final final rift. Yes. Was, was the female clergy, was that an earlier movement? That was an earlier fight, and it resulted in a compromise. For about 25 years, the highest denominational body, which is its synod, it's it's basically its um its agenda continued to be clogged by this question of female clergy. And so in 1995, the denomination decided local churches can decide what they'd like to do. And at that point, about forty to 60,000 members of the denomination left, founded the United Reformed Church and a few other little splinter groups. And so at that point, the Christian Reformed Church did permit the ordination of women um, if a local church wished it. And then the, there were rules that sort of leveled it up. That People tend to see these issues as sort of being in the same line. And I can understand there's certain commonalities between them culturally, but whereas if you look in church history, you know, there's a lot of debate as to Junia and a few other Lydia, a few other figures in the Bible, to what degree did, let's say, Lydia in Philippi, to what degree was she the head of that church there? And throughout church history, there have been a number of traditions which have had um, women in leadership in the church. And you know, certain Pentecostal groups have had it. The Salvation Army has long had it. A lot of people don't necessarily recognize the Salvation Army as a church, but that's essentially what they are. So, but the same-sex marriage question, biblically, you're just really hard-pressed to make that argument from the Bible in the same way that you can look at that and say, well, how are we to decide about permissibility of women and leadership in the church? So, it's... Churches that say allow women leadership but are traditional in terms of their sexuality, they, they look like outliers on the church um, on the church spectrum. But yeah, well we're gonna continue to see these issues sort of play out in the culture. Um, but yeah, so and, and then it'll be interesting to see some people are worried because well, if the Christian Reform Church chose to go conservative on the same-sex marriage question, are they going to roll back the women in office question? I suspect not. But I think that the the challenges that the Christian Reformed Church faces are actually far larger and longer because I think, you know, we really have to look at the, um, the lack of intergenerational continuity in the church. For many years, the Christian Reformed Church did, was very good at maintaining intergenerational continuity. Children would grow up in the church, they'd be catechized in the church, they would be married in the church, they'd have families in the church, and their children would go to the church. And that has broken down. And so these issues themselves don't really kill the church. The deep challenge of the church is always, can you evangelize the next generation? That that may be the only challenge. That may, that may be the only challenge, really. Yeah. Right. So so if he, if each man can do his do his his respective job, his duty. I mean, that's that that's what that's what it ensures the long term survival, hopefully, um, of of the church. Uh, you, you had a you had a, you made a few comments, and there were some comments I think by by the guests in the in the jazz cow. I want to get back to because you you mentioned a second ago or a few minutes ago the the these uh, 
these English, like the, uh, uh, the, the Dominion author and some of, the, some of these Brits that have recently come to faith, uh, Paul King's North, uh, pe uh, people like that. And um, the, there was a comment made there that, that the gentleman knew of three individual people that lost their jobs because they were vocal about their Christian faith. Not, not vocal, so, mentioned. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah, this isn't the case of someone sort of being an obnoxious evangelist at work. This is a mention of other people in the office. Oh, he goes to church. Well, you don't want to hire anybody who does that. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Well, so so that 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 gets that gets to a to a point about the the role of a man and what a man looks like uh, in society. And if we're if we're going to be following. Europe down that track, and you sort of see a lot of that here in in the spaces, maybe corollary to the space where you work, where men will come off as intellectuals uh, or, or maybe wrestlers of of other podcasts that they had seen, and they don't really want to talk about faith because either they're embarrassed about it or they don't think they can defend it as if it was their job to defend it. Yeah, um, they're they're very ashamed of it, and obviously there's a there's someone that said if you're ashamed of me, I'll sh I'll be ashamed of you. Yeah. Uh, my father, and so and so. There, there's this predicate here. Like, what, what is what is really your role, or, or maybe Christian leadership's role, in trying to get these these younger men who who are not uh, not as outright or not not as forthcoming about their faith to, to get them be more pervasive about their faith and how they and how they work and how they live. I, I think there's a particular complexity to this in Christianity because of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus Jesus sort of, you know, I, I look at it, okay, I use a lot of language from John Verveke because he has a lot, opponent processing. And people have noted for a long time, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount on one hand says, you know, you do not hide a lamp under a bushel, let your light shine. At the same time, at the beginning of chapter six, he says, do not practice your righteousness to be seen before men. And so one of the things that Christians have to figure out is how to have a public witness without doing your acts of righteousness to be seen before men. And I think Jesus, I think Jesus gives us, again, my, my larger theme in this moment of culture war is Christians learn, the lit, Christians take their tactics of culture war from Jesus. Um, because on one hand, Jesus says, okay, well, what about your giving? Well, don't let the left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't practice your righteousness to say, to, for the, the acclaim of people. At the same time, <laughs> he's, his, his righteousness is, you know, the, the, the deepest, as with many things in the Christian religion, the moment where this comes together perfectly is at the cross. Because on one hand, the cross is the epitome of loss and failure, just like we talked about earlier. I, preserve my, I, preserve, I, pres, I prefer my Messiahs uncrucified. I want to have a winner. But at that moment, when everyone around him thinks he's losing, Jesus is actually winning. And... I think in the Christian community, we've learned this to do this in many ways. And I see it happening in church. Someone, you know, someone in church has a need and they're in a tight spot. And then they say, Pastor, there was, a, there was an envelope in my mailbox with the money to pay the bills. I don't know who gave that to me. Do you know who? Well, if I did know who, they obviously don't want you to know. Praise God. <laughs> That's the goal. And so we... And so in this culture, we have to learn this dance where we, we should be the best kinds of people people know. And, and, you know, when asked, the Apostle Paul says, if someone asks you, well, why do you do this? Be ready to give that testimony. But um, the last thing that anybody wants to see is self-righteousness and sanctimonious behavior. And so again, with Jesus, we learn this dance. And what's amazing about Jesus is that he, on one hand, there's a small group of people that look to him and think, he's it. Nobody else understands him. And that seems to be exactly the way Jesus wanted it, which is incredibly astounding. So I think if you're a, if you're a Christian 
and you want to know how you should live your life, I would say be the kind of person that blesses the world and people will only figure it out at your funeral. Wow. I love that. I love that. And and I'd say for the rest of it, you know, it's hilarious because you look at Jesus, he's constantly get, being criticized for not being the kind of religious person everyone wants to be. Your disciples don't seem to be fasting at the appropriate time, Jesus. Why don't you take them aside and make them fast? Who fasts when the bridegroom is here? Jesus, why are you healing this man on the Sabbath? Well, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, he basically says. Now, now we want to stone you. And, and so again and again, you see Jesus dealing with these tensions and I think for us today who, who have certain, you know, I, I think actually it could be that in the British context, because of the strange way in which, of course, you have a state church there, so ostensibly everyone's a Christian, but then hardly anyone's a Christian. So I, I think in some ways they're still sort of dealing with the, dealing with sort of the empire that was there. In America, it's a little bit easier because in the public life, we have this sort of secular thing. And so you come into the secular world and, okay, maybe you're a benefactor of the city and you're going to bless the city in a certain way. Maybe keep your Christianity quiet. But then if someone asks you, and I, I see this all the time, well, why, why, why do you give so much money away? Well, then explain. Just humbly, yeah. quietly. And I think that's sort of the modern dance. Yeah, and, and I think also, you know, I, as I was watching that, that, that interview with yet another Brit, I think we had a conversation about, about using the word Brit. I'm pretty sure it's derogatory. I shouldn't be using it, but I'm going to use it anyway. <laughs> but, 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 but these are the people of Wilberforce. Yeah. Like, the, like yeah. those, like that is, that is his people. Yeah. And it's like they, like they haven't read Wilberforce or they haven't gone next door virtually to, and, and read their Bonhoeffer. Like the the role of the good is to do violence against violence. I mean, that's yeah. what Christ was doing on the cross. Yeah. And 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 so I, I think it's got to be mediated, right? I, I think you're I think you're right. You have you have these 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 I guess compounding paradoxes on the the, the Sermon on the Mount, meek shall inherit the earth, and that sort of thing. But then you also have these these real life representations of I'm going to assassinate Hitler. Yeah. And it, it come it comes about in different ways, and I don't I just don't know. I, you know, I'm I'm more I'm more of a Bonhoeffer guy. Well, I like to think of myself a Bonhoeffer guy, but of course Peterson says, you know, you're, you're, we're all really just Nazi guards, and <laughs> and and so you know, it, it's hard to figure out. You know, us people that want to be in the in the the fate of, of Bonhoeffer, we get frustrated by the folks that are that are a little bit less at, you know, a little bit more apprehensive about that, and I guess it's just a it's just an exercise of patience. Well, I think it also takes different kinds in a body and and you see this with um you know in a church you'll have some people who might be activistic about this issue or that issue others who are more quiet you know each of us obviously as individuals have to will one day be called to give an account before our lord for what we've done with our um with our time and with our agency in this world um, and, and I think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing that there's a fair amount of diversity in the body of Christ. You know, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this tussle that's going on today over the, the Jesus Super Bowl ad. And one side is like, no, you need more of this and you need more of that. And part of me thinks, I'm glad we have all of these sides speaking into it because the answer isn't really a balance. The answer is more... I, so Tim Keller in his book, I don't remember which book it was, but he pull, he plucked up from Jonathan Edwards. Um, Uh-oh. Uh, just got a little... Okay, I'm all right. <laughs> There's a little message in, from Riverside here. Okay. He he pulled up this, this idea from Jonathan Edwards of diverse excellencies. That the, the, the reason Jesus in reading about him in the Gospels today is as fresh as it's ever been, which is an astounding thing. And Tom Holland notes this because here, here Jesus, the, the gospel writers had to communicate something 
to an incredible diversity of cultures, far more than any of the gospel writers could ever have imagined. And they did it. And four people did it at the same time. And the reason all four did it at the same time is because they're writing about the same man. And they're recording his words. Jesus is so demanding of us. You know, anyone who would be my disciple must take up his cross and follow me. And, and especially if you understand what that meant in terms of the cross, it's like, oh. And then, you know, anyone who looks at a woman with lust in his heart is committing adultery. And, and, and Jesus is giving these, these statements of such high moral and ethical standards. We all look at them and say, no man can attain that. And then he goes and he's at a, he's at a party and a woman who has probably been sleeping with Roman soldiers, comes in and washes his feet with her tears and you know dries his feet with her hair, and everyone is scandalized. And you would think, someone who preaches such high moral character, how could he at the same time extend such radical generosity? And Jonathan Edwards looked and said, that, that, this, right there, is why Jesus is, you know, is how we recognize the Son of God in him. Because God at one at one time is usually blamed for being, you know, way too permissive and maybe even negligent in what he allows happen in this world. And at the same time, way too demanding in what he requires of us to be like him. And Jesus has both of those in us. Now, most of us we can't hit that range. And so some are going to be over here and some are going to be over there. And in terms of the body of Christ, well, Jesus, we are his witnesses. We just can't really bear witness to the spectrum and the span of his glory. And so we tend to be majoring over here. But it's a good thing we have those parts of the body there too. So it tends to be how yeah. I see it. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think a lot of this has to do with uh, I think it was the English 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 linguist uh, Hayakaya that had this ladder of extraction. The way that you speak, right? Mm -hmm. You got the bottom, you've got very the concrete measure of how you speak, and then at the very top, you have this sort of ethereal level. And it seems to me when I when I listen to some people, um, they're they're speaking up here. They're speaking ninety percent of the time in the abstraction. It's almost like it's almost like the the, the French intellectuals of the of the early 1900s where they're hiding something mm. it's it, they're, they're hiding something and and all they want to do is put up this front of i'm a smart person don't don't mess with me <laughs> and and a lot of that you hear this you hear this by uh, meaning oriented people uh on on different channels as well where they're speaking at just kind of an astronomically ethereal level yeah. i'm like well give me something meaty like like give me true wisdom that that's yeah. something that i can use things that you just spoke about and I think a lot of young men, like I alluded to earlier, are, are sort of hiding up here, and they really don't have anything right here. And uh, it's 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 like it's like what uh, what Lewis said that that work is prayer. Like yeah. it, it's not yeah. like faith is not a is not a like an ethereal intellectual capacity. You want to use one hundred percent of your intellect, but but it's also a, it's also a it's also a working faith. All right. I made a video built to it. I made a video a while ago about why do simple Christians often outperform sophisticated Christians, which gets at that. And you notice that in church because, you know, you've got some people who, you know, they've been, they've got an education, they've got high IQs, they've been to school, they can talk a good game. But then when, you know, something happens, who shows up? It might be the young earth six-day creationist who has you know worked a trades job his whole life and he sees someone in need and he just helps them and you say hmm and you see this and jesus says you know who 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 has who's the one that the father recognizes you know it's the it's the widow who you know she gives all that she has it's the two sons father says to them go do this one says i'll do it and then doesn't and the other says i won't and then does i mean jesus points to this all the time and we see it in the church again and again so yeah. and again as, yeah. as a pastor part of what's glorious as a pastor and not as let's say 
an intellectual or I've you know I've really tried to avoid becoming a a celebrity Christian online you know I'm a, I'm a Christian on the internet talking if, when you're in a church you see this stuff played out again and again and it's it's there for all of us to see <laughs> it always is <laughs> I, I hear you're going to going to Italy sometime. yeah yeah I have a son I have a son who he and his fiance decided that um the, the, so I have one son who's getting married in California this summer and one son who's getting married in Italy. And you can see the, the, the exchanges of problems. Well, if you, you go to Italy, then you don't have to worry about the wedding list. You do it in California, then you have to think about the wedding list. So it's two ways to go we're, about we're, it. We're, we're in Italy. Uh, Some place in Tuscany. I, I haven't looked at it on the map. So so And I've never been there, so we're going to, you know, once you, once you do the big bite of buying those airplane tickets so then we're going to hopefully see as much as we can and in, in in that little bit of time plus you know do justice to the wedding so yeah I, I i highly recommend it was actually our first trip to tuscany this past year for my wife and i and we went up to uh florence and florence is is just phenomenal i mean we we saw dante's house and then we walked a few feet around the corner to the church where beatrice is buried it's just complete and utter insanity there, and then of course yeah. you've got uh, you've got David there. You've all sorts of just great artwork, so I highly recommend that. Um, I've, I've got I've got two more follow up questions for you. Are you good for for another five or ten minutes? Yeah, I'm fine. Five, five? Okay, okay, all right, cool, cool, cool. You see, um, the so ladies first... are still in there. No, uh, oh, we're okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one thing about you know I, I'll often I mean live streams are always difficult because you never know what's going to happen. Come to the door, so. Yes, yes, but I should yes, be yes. good. So, what are you what are you reading right now? I'm always reading too many things. Um, I, I picked up Thomas Carlyle on on heroes and finding that to be it's a it's a controversial book, but um, there's a there's there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. So I'm reading that, and I'm trying to get through Faith, Hope, and Carnage by Nick Cave. I keep um, I keep starting. I keep starting that, and and it's just so rich and full. I have to back up and and just meditate on it before I go for that. And I'm also working through um, Chesterton's biography of Saint Francis, which is just wonderful. So, and and there's there's lots of other books that I've got started. I, I I'm so ADHD. I always, I guess Chesterton does this too. I heard this somewhere where. Um, you, you listen to one and then you listen to another and you read another and you read another. And it's sort of, for me, it's part of synthesis. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, I was watching an interview with Doug Wilson just a few minutes ago before we got on the air. And I think he reads generally four things at a time. One of them is always poetry. Oh, and that's pretty smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I've done that for probably about a year and it's, it's been really, really refreshing just that, just to interlude maybe read, you know, one short poem a day. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah. It, it's nice, and so I've I've been using it as a bridge between uh, sacred reading all the way, you know, to whatever I'm learning about, and that's that's been a refreshing activity personally. What, what do you What do you want to read this year? Sorry. Oh, I want to finish. I want to finish. I want to finish a dozen books that I've started. Um, <laughs> I I would so I, I want to mention Cal Zeldin, who's he teaches he teaches great books at a little Catholic. Um, prep school in Rhode Island and he's been putting poetry on Twitter. I mean every day he's just making a little video. I'm I'm somewhat dyslexic and so when audiobooks came around to me that was a huge thing because it doesn't mean that it I I find then if I listen to a book and if I read a book I interact with the book in two different ways. I want to actually. We are going to spend some time in Florence, and so Dante is on my list. I took a course in college on the Divine Comedy, but I was way too young to appreciate it. So I, you know, I'd like to take a look at Dante again before I before I go. And um, yeah, and there's so much now. There's 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 just. I mean, I before Jordan Peterson, I had no idea what was on YouTube. And yeah, there's there's a lot of inanity and a lot of chasing the clicks, but there's also a lot of great stuff that in small channels that people have labors of love with. Um, another little guy in the corner, another guy in the corner 
goes by Charlie Brown or Stefan. I met him in Germany. He started um, he started you know working on um, on Goethe, which there's just there's just so. I mean, we are we live in an incredible time where we have access to far more beauty and knowledge and wisdom than we'll ever have time to uh, bring into our awareness, never mind digest. So, Yeah, yeah. So one thing that I found useful in my knowing that I was going to travel to Florence several months in advance, I started with the, um, the Inferno, then Purgatorio, and then Paradiso. So that, so that I finished Paradiso the day that I was going into Florence. Oh, wow. Okay. So we we actually we actually took a we actually took a boat across ten cities, and so we were we were on the boat that morning. I finished Paradiso as just an hour before we we disembarked and went went into Florence, and uh, and it was it was incredible. I mean, it it was just amazing being able to see all that, um, and uh, and also another another great thing. I don't know if you've seen the uh, the the what is it called the um, the De Medici's uh, series on Netflix. I haven't seen that. That is a that is a must watch because you see the you see the integration of not only uh, Da Vinci but also uh, Niccolo, Niccolo Machiavelli yeah. makes an appearance there and also the, the kind of this two year two hundred year uh, struggle for power in Europe and they're they're just outright bribery and control of the papal authority and all that it plays center stage right there in uh, in Florence and when you get to Florence then you see you see the, the, the cathedral there that they built and the dome that they built, and you see all these sites, and it just helps glue everything together. Okay. Uh, it, was, it was very, very rewarding. Interesting, interesting. Well, I will, I will, I will, I will suggest it. I, basically, the only time I watch TV is with my wife, so I'll, uh, I'll suggest it to her that we take this in for uh, preparation for, for our time in Florence. It's it's yes, gonna be yes. it's gonna be fun though because it's you know I've got five kids and they're all young adults now and so one of the things that we've learned is that if we want to if we want to lure them all together the uh, the price tag is getting larger you know hey do you want to go to Massachusetts eh. you want to go to Italy I'm in so <laughs> but it costs more <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah. Well, I want to I want to I want to end with a question. The only other person I've asked this question is uh, to, a question to on a on a podcast was Ruslan, the Christian rapper. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and so I, I'd really like to get your take on that. This is a this is a take on the on the famous quote that Eleanor Roosevelt uh, would use on a, on occasion. Um, the question, Paul, is what would you do if you knew you could never die? Well, on one hand. That's if you believe in the resurrection. I I don't know that I would do a lot different than I'm doing now. I I love I love what I do. My wife sometimes is 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 deeply jealous of 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 me because she's like you you generally do what you love and i do now there are always little duties that are like oh, i gotta go do this um but for the most part i'm i'm a deeply fortunate person and that i love what i do and what i'm doing right now is continuing to get a chance to pastor this lovely tiny little local church i get to make friends on the internet and discover people and ideas that i never knew of i i tend to think that um, I'd, I'd like to do this till the day I die. And actually when I get to glory, I won't just be reading Dante's work, but I'll get to go and meet the guy. And so, you know, how cool is that? You know, if we think of, if I never die, we tend to think of, okay, if I'm in this world forever, oh, that I'm not sure about that. But when I think of when I think of what Christ is doing in preparation for the new heaven and new earth, and I will be with the Lord, and I will be with the other saints, I I, I don't see a downside in any of that. So that's I think I I think I I think I'll keep doing what I'm doing. I love that. I love that. Well, Paul, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, thanks everyone for joining the live stream. And feel free to leave comments below. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Rick.
Thank you, Paul.